capabilities. For example, sending CIA personnel forward in time to gather data or artifacts from the future and bring it back. They were identifying individuals of my generation, of you know Barack Obama's generation, mm -hmm. uh, as future world leaders, and they were essentially uh, doing things in our youth and later to sort of cultivate our, our destinies. <laughs> They're not responsible for my achievements, but they knew about them, and the U.S. intelligence community did take measures to make sure that my destiny uh, would be fulfilled. So that's another dimension of this that the public has never really been has been kept ignorant about is the fact that time travel technology was not only derived or you know reduced to practice 40 years ago based on the work of Tesla based on on Enrico Fermi's uh, involvement actually in both of those technologies uh, Fermi had been sought out by Ernetti and Jumelli and worked on them with the chronovisor and Enrico Fermi was also the mentor of Dr. Harold Agnew um, at the University of Chicago when the atomic bomb was being developed. Hmm. Um, so, so I'm also speaking out because something is influencing um, our politics, and that is the fact that a faction within the U.S. intelligence community has been in possession of a quantum access capability for over 40 years. And I know to a personal certainty that they have been handling particular individuals in light of a prior understanding, in light of previous findings of what their destinies are. And in fact, that is even influencing the way in which the people of the United States select their president, because I know to a personal certainty, having met three of them and having heard of one of them when I was in the project, that the four last American presidents were given prior knowledge of their presidencies based on the quantum access capabilities of the U.S. intelligence community. Hmm. And since that, since I believe in upholding the Constitution, I'm, I'm obligated to do. I'm actually sworn to do so as an attorney in the state of Washington, to to uphold the U.S. Constitution, just as the president does. I'm speaking out as an officer of the court and essentially as a, a constitutional officer, informing the people of the United States and and also the people of the world that the uh, permanent secret government of the United States is in possession of such a capability. And it is influencing presidential politics to the extent that the, the future presidents are being approached and informed of their destinies and in all likelihood <laughs> receiving specialized training for the presidency. And uh, that's a subversion of, of, of the U.S. Constitution. And that's another thing that's motivating me to speak out about, about the fact that the United States government is in possession of quantum access. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I have obviously a ton of questions here for you. Maybe we can just talk a little bit about... Uh, if you remember all of the experiments that you went through, and and if you like generally about your life during that time, did you go to school uh, regularly, and and did you talk about this, or, or were you in some way uh, gagged or prevented to to speak at the time about this stuff? Well, I had I had a remarkably happy and and even adventuresome childhood just in my ordinary life. I was the youngest of five children, and I was going to a very uh, very good a public elementary school in a very wonderful town. I think I was a lucky kid. Um, but really, there, beginning around age six or seven, my father, who had been a participant on several advanced aerospace projects, for example, he was one of the principal engineers who had designed the ramjet engine uh, at Curtis Wright. In fact, after the July 1952 overflight of Washington, D.C., uh, by nine UFOs tracked it at traveling at 7,000 miles per hour by Langley Air Force Base. Yes. My dad had been working for the Okanite Company in Paramus, New Jersey, and an Army officer appeared beside his desk, as he later explained it, at Okanite, and handed him orders to report, you know, from orders from the Defense Department, to report to Curtis Wright, where he worked on the ramjet engine, which was such a classified project at that time that he was even eating... You couldn't even eat lunch with guys with different colored badges. You know, it was a compartmentalized project. Right, right. Its purpose was to um, was to create a, a basically a, a, a supersonic plane that could chase the, uh, the UFOs out of our out of our atmosphere and, and near space environment. So my dad had been on that project. He'd also been on the B seventy, which was the atomic equipped strategic bomber project. Um, and other, he was preparing other technical reports for military and intelligence agencies. So, even though I must, I must uh, 
you know, give thanks for the fact that I had a very happy and secure childhood in a, in a wonderful family and, and a wonderful neighborhood at a wonderful time in American history, almost a bucolic kind of childhood. We were fishing in the summer and playing hockey, you know, ice hockey in local ponds in the winter. My dad did bring me within the cult of intelligence as a very small child. He began taking me to the defense contractor locations where he worked. And in fact, my first acclimation trip for Project Pegasus was in the, was in the summer vacation after kindergarten. He took me to the uh, General Manufacturing Company facility in Convent Station, New Jersey, where the, the chronovisor originally would be located that we wouldn't encounter until the fall of 1970. So here, four or five years in advance, when I'm, when I'm, you know, five, six years old, he was already preparing me for some of these defense contractor locations that I wouldn't see for three or four years. Um, now, at school, we were enrolled in a learning lab that was essentially um, uh, a sequestered learning environment that was cut off from the rest of the school. They, they took one of the art labs and they set up a special program for gifted and talented students uh, in that part of the school that we were attending on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. So they had us starting off the week in the learning lab and spending about 60% of our schooling there uh, during third, fourth, and fifth grade. This would have been beginning in the fall of 1969 and, and lasting until the end of my fifth grade year in, in summer of 1972. And so we would show up there and spend three days out of five in that context, and then we'd have, you know, Fridays we would be back with our peers in our normal classroom to kind of readjust before going uh, home, you know, to our house and, you know, our family and neighborhood for the weekends and everything. Mm -hmm. So they were really grooming us at a young age. We, we were given both sort of positive and negative reinforcement to not talk about our experiences. Um, Right, right there in the learning lab, however, they, they began to involve us in extremely unusual activities, some of it academic, but some of it really on the outer envelope of parapsychology testing and training. Initially, they started us uh, with this um, advanced academic program called Galileo, which covered all of the advances in science and the important historical events from the year 1450, which would be the time of the High Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And we were trained how to read things almost instantaneously. And we were, we were receiving specialized education on these devices called tachistoscopes, which were speed learning machines that had been developed by the Office of Naval Research and that had been manufactured at one of my late father's former employers, which was the Thomas A. Edison Research Labs in West Orange, New Jersey. And through that uh, means, we would, we would stand at a device and essentially receive sort of this college liberal arts education. You know, I think we must have gotten a BA in, in the history of science and, and world civilization for those three years. <laughs> in fact, that speed learning was so saturating that there were, there were U.S. Army field hospital cots in the learning lab, and so we would spend several hours with, in the speed learning with this stuff whizzing past us, huh. and then we would actually sometimes collapse and fall asleep on the cots. So they, they were essentially giving us all of the information they thought we should have in our heads when we were time traveling. We would have an understanding, let's say, like a BA in electrical engineering would have from college of basic historical developments in science and in society. Um, then, as, we, as that was ongoing for those three years, very early on they began us in parapsychology screening and training. So one of the things they started off with was the teacher would look at a standard playing card and put it to her forehead and concentrate on it, and we would have to guess the playing card that she was thinking of. And I was so clairvoyant during those years that we would play that game for, let's say, two hours, and I was getting the playing card right every time she would come to me, you know, working with three or four children. So uh, I and a number of the other children were really testing on the far right side of the bell curve in terms of psi abilities, and that was one of the traits that they were looking for. Hmm. They were looking for bright, perceptive, psychically active children, and that's what they found. Um, then the parapsychology training really got, went off into some very far out areas, even before we left the, the environment there of the learning lab and started being taken to defense contractor locations. Uh, for example, they were spinning us to induce out-of-body experiences. 
And sometimes while going out of 